Eastern time. Now, I also will tell you as we near landfall on Thursday, typically the Hurricane Center does introduce hourly updates on those stats and location ahead of landfall. So here's a look at it on uh, satellite imagery. We're looking at the infrared filter here and why I like to use this, especially with this particular filter that with the color cord coordinated on it is because it gives us the temperatures of the cloud tops and really tells us where the strongest convection or thunderstorm activity is. Colder the cloud tops, stronger the thunderstorms. The colder cloud tops are depicted by the shades of white and you can see the center of Helene right there. We're starting to see strong convection trying to wrap around it. If you recall yesterday's video, this was asymmetrical, lopsided on the eastern side because we had wind shear. That wind shear has really dissipated. It's moving into a more ideal environment, but notice also here on this 12-hour um, loop that we start to see a bend of the center part of a Helene, a bend to the northwest. This is the Yucatan. There's Cancun and there's Cozumel. A land interaction could be a short-term disruptor here. If the core of Helene does make its way over the northern tip of the Yucatan, it's not enhanced terrain, but it is land. It'll take it away from its fuel source for at least a short period of time and likely lead to at least a slight degradation of its intensity as it enters the Gulf of Mexico. Because as I mentioned, once it gets in the Gulf of Mexico, there's nothing to really slow it down from intensifying into a big time storm before landfall in Florida. Yesterday, what was influencing it? Upper level low over uh, to the northwest of the center of, of Helene. But we also had Hurricane John in the eastern Pacific that made landfall in southern Mexico. It's a major hurricane. It has really been sheared apart from the enhanced terrain in southern Mexico. Now it's just a remnant low. And since it has weakened, the wind shear from it has really lessened. I also want to show you here what may also come into play later on. We've got a little bit of some dry air on the water vapor imagery off to the northwest here. Maybe some of that gets pulled into the center circulation. We can hope and that would kind of choke it off just a little bit to weaken it. But I mean, these are small things that could come into play here that could weaken it. But really, you know, we're just hoping for the best. And that does uh, work to slow it down at least a little bit in its intensification. Because look at the warm water. It is over. Not only is the surface temperatures of the ocean here in the Caribbean, Northwest Caribbean, mid to upper 80s, but it also extends down to a great depth, something we call ocean heat content. And when you see shades like this, the reds and pinks and magentas here, um, that increases the probability of a rapid intensification process with this storm. When you've got such deep warm water here, there's just an endless amount of fuel. When you tack that onto an ideal atmospheric profile, which it will be moving into, that could come into play. And in fact, here, when we look at the intensity forecast for Helene, the Hurricane Center does forecast rapid intensification. By Wednesday morning, we're at a Category 1 hurricane here. It may even come sooner than that. But then from there to 24 hours later, we're up to 115 mile per hour winds, Category 3 storm. That's an increase in, in sustained winds of 40 miles per hour. The Definition of rapid intensification is an increase in sustained winds of 35 miles per hour or greater within a 24 hour period. So that would satisfy that criteria. Again, we'll probably see it overperform. So we've got the ingredients there. We've got the very warm water temperatures, at least 80 degrees, well above that. A low wind shear environment. We had this year yesterday, that is gone. And an ideal upper air setup. So we've got inflow at the surface, right? And we need outflow aloft. So we need that ideal environment for it to ventilate property properly for it to stand up and have good posture as it builds to the north and northwest and eventually to the north and northeast towards Florida. So it can take advantage of an ideal atmospheric setup. So here's a look at this storm uh, forecast cone from the Hurricane Center. Again, off of the 8 o'clock advisory. This is the 5 p.m. track, though. Does forecast a Category 1 storm by Wednesday afternoon. I think we see it before then. But nonetheless, I want to draw your attention to the bend here to the northwest with the forecast cone as well. And that's interesting because when you look at the spaghetti plots, the clustering here has shifted a little bit farther to the west. More members are favoring at least a minimal land interaction here near Cancun. Still, there is a, a lot more models that farther to the east that take it through the Yucatan Channel 
and over the warm water, keeps the core over the warm water, meaning there wouldn't be much weakening at all. Then it drives to the north and we'd have a spread still, but a much smaller spread than we did yesterday, really honing in on the Big Bend area of Florida for a potential landfall Thursday evening. Then it builds inland and bends to the northwest and we see it kind of envelops by a big piece of upper level energy sitting over the middle parts of the country. All right, here's the rest of that forecast cone, because once it gets into the Gulf of Mexico, as I mentioned, it doesn't have much to slow it down. Look at how quickly it goes from a cat one all the way up to a cat three. And between here, when it's already at 115 mile per hour category three, it will likely continue to intensify right up to landfall like we've seen happen so many times before, especially if the overall upper level environment remains favorable, which it's forecast to be, and then it makes landfall and rapidly deteriorates here. It's also going to be moving at a pretty good clip. So the forward speed paired with those wind speeds is going to only add to the wind damage potential, especially on the eastern side, the right side of the storm as it builds inland. We call that the dirty side of the storm. And then as you can see, it builds inland and it's going to be a big disruptor here in the middle parts of the country. Lots of heavy rain and lots of wind as well. Now we talked about the forecast cone here and a lot of folks tend to see that cone and when they're outside of it, they dismiss any potential impacts because the storm is going to stay inside the cone. However, that's where the center of Helene is forecast to stay. And that only occurs really two thirds of the time. There is an error that it does sometimes, you know, evolve outside of that. But the impacts happen well outside of the cone. And I just wanted to show you here, this is going to be where the potential impacts are still felt, even when Helene tracks within that forecast cone. The wind field as it approaches landfall will likely be 400 miles in diameter of tropical storm force winds. So that is well outside of this cone, stretching west and east. So a high impact event for a large area for wind, heavy rainfall, and eventually flooding. Let's talk about those threats. We'll start with wind. Here's our future cast modeling here. This is our in-house high resolution short range model. So we're looking at the start here of the system and I want to draw your attention to one big difference that's already occurring. This is the forecast cone from the National Hurricane Center. And here's where the models think the center of Helene currently is. Notice it is to the east of where the uh, Hurricane Center thinks it is right now. This is just one computer model, but just take that uh, for as it is. And as we go a little bit farther out, Let's go to Wednesday, 10 a.m., tomorrow at 10 a.m. This particular model does spare any land interaction. So it stays to the east of Cancun in the Yucatan Channel, the core, and on the eastern side, the right side of the forecast cone. We go out a little bit farther since there is no land interaction according to this model run. It is already a strong storm entering the Gulf and it will only get stronger. So wind speeds in the wind field, so everything that's in blue here, this tropical storm force winds 39 miles per hour or greater. Look at how large that wind field is already. And even though it's right here on Thursday, just after midnight, early, early Thursday morning, already potentially seeing some tropical storm force gusts make it into southeastern, start, southwestern parts of Florida. Go out a little bit farther in time. Here we are Thursday mid-morning. We've got a stronger Helene at this point, potentially already a Category 3 with winds 110 to 115, maybe even higher than that. But... Right side of the storm, dirty side, we're already seeing the onshore flow. So here's Tampa Bay. Water's already getting blown into Tampa Bay. Storm surge values will be very high all along the southwestern Florida coast. Go a little bit farther out in time, 3.15 in the afternoon on Thursday. Larger storm, Cat 1, maybe even Cat 2 winds approaching the Florida coastline. Again, this is to the west of the Florida's west coast, so we've got the onshore winds blowing all that water onshore and bring the storm surge values up. Here we approach landfall. This particular model brings a landfall right in the Taylor County in Florida as a category three, prepare for a category higher. It can certainly overperform. We've got widespread gusty winds here in excess of 100 miles per hour. And then even going out into the pre-dawn hours of Friday, after it's well inland, we're looking at central and southeastern portions of Georgia that are seeing a ton of wind here. This is why it's going to be a big power outage generator down to Savannah, Macon, maybe even in the uh, suburbs of Atlanta, getting up into South Carolina as well. And then the wind speeds will go down, but it's just drifting north and it's still going to be affecting a lot of folks as it drifts to the north and eventually weakens. Now let's talk about rainfall potential here. Manageable totals through Florida. 
at least in the southern portions of Florida, south and central Florida. However, getting up into the peninsula and certainly into Georgia, the the problem really starts to get emphasized when that tropical moisture butts up against the increased terrain of the Appalachians. We see a ton more rain as all that tropical moisture is forced to converge and comes into tropical downpours. So we could be looking at a half foot, maybe some areas seeing a foot of rain, despite the storm not slowing down like we've seen a lot of times. If this were an instance where it was slowing down, we could triple these numbers. Thankfully, we're not, but still with a fast movement, we're still picking up 6 to 9 to 12 inches of rain potentially. All right, that's the latest on Helene. We also have one other, not a storm yet, but an area we're watching to likely become the next storm, Isaac. 80% chance of that happening within the short term. That's a 50% chance. So we've got Helene already. Isaac is up next and potentially Joyce and then Kirk. So that's the latest out here on Tropical Storm Helene. Next time we talk, it'll likely be a hurricane. I will see you tomorrow. If you have any questions on this, you can always reach out in the comments or find me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, X, or TikTok. We'll see you Wednesday.